Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 This 
Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate.
This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. Good afternoon. If I can ask everyone to take their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. We will call the meeting together. This is the Select Committee on Manufactured Homes and Communities. This is a little bit of a different setup. I think you guys are all kind of looking at each other, so we'll uh, turn a little bit and make sure it works for all of us. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you very much for taking time out of your day to be here. We have four very distinguished panels that are going to provide us with some uh, expert testimony. This is a fact-finding hearing that will focus on the need for training and licensing of mobile home park on-site managers. We will hear from prominent state and local representatives from California's mobile and manufactured housing community. I have had the privilege of being the chair of the mobile home uh, select committee for about a year and a half now. I hope that as long as I am elected as your state senator, I will continue to get that, to have that honor. I think there is a lot of work to do in mobile home uh, communities. I think it is is one of the last bastions of affordable housing, and we want to make sure that uh, it's working well for everyone. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to have all of you here with me. I have my consultant, Stephanie Reed, who I would just like to ask all of you to give her a round of applause and thank her. Because she is retiring after how many years, Stephanie? Uh, with the state, about 31. 31 years with the state. She has been such a help to me in this last year and a half. I am very grateful to her. And I'm going to miss you a lot, Stephanie. But you know what? The time has come, and she should go and enjoy her retirement. So thank you for everything, Stephanie. It's been greatly appreciated. Uh, I would also like to thank all of the witnesses and those in the audience for taking your time out for being here. I especially want to thank the County of San Bernardino for allowing us the opportunity to use the supervisor's chambers. Senate and county staffs are working together today to record and also live stream this on the internet. So, members in the audience, you can text your friends and let them know that they can watch you at sd20.senate.ca.gov. So just make sure you know that you're going to be on TV this entire time. Uh, I have another uh, very exciting announcement. Those of you who parked in the parking lot that says it's only three hours, that is going to be waived today. So if we are here for three hours and one minute, you will not have to worry about that. Um, at this time, it is really my pleasure to introduce to you um, Mr. James Ramos, who is the chair of the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors. He's going to wel welcome us. Please sit down, um, Mr. Chair. I have had the pleasure of knowing Mr. Ramos for a very long time, and 
appreciate all the work that he's doing uh, for the County of San Bernardino. It's been some trying times, and uh, you've really handled yourself uh, grace under pressure. Thank you so much. Supervisor Ramos. Thank you, Senator Anderson. And thank you for choosing San Bernardino County and the board chambers to um, conduct this um, informational hearing um, that's going to be um, ongoing here today. On behalf of San Bernardino County, we, we welcome you to um, our chambers um, as you're sitting there and leading the hearing um, and moving it forward. Um, and Senator, really a deep, heartfelt appreciation to you and, and your colleagues out there for always remembering San Bernardino County. Certainly, you're no stranger to, to what it is and legislative things that we've moved forward. We currently have a bill that we're encouraging the governor to sign um, that deals with um, December 2nd. So it's a good um, ongoing relationship. We are also honored to have the strong partnership of the whole um, caucus um, with us um, throughout this time and the times that we've faced here um, in the last 18 months here in San Bernardino County that is truly as a family of electeds um, at all levels that we come together and support one another. Um, so on behalf of the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors, as chairman of the Board of Supervisors, I want to welcome you here to San Bernardino County and thank you for choosing this area to perform this inv informational hearing. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Supervisor Ramos. It's a pleasure to have you here and let us know how we continue to be helpful in the State Senate. Thank you. So we're here today um, because I have uh, had the pleasure of touring about 10 mobile home parks in the last year and a half, and I have gotten um, a lot of feedback on a variety of issues, but the issue that we want to talk about today is the impact of untrained property managers. So these are the folks that manage the mobile home parks. Um, and the impact that them being untrained is having on residents in mobile homes and trailer parks. Okay, all is good, all is good. Uh, the purpose of this fact gathering hearing is to determine uh, how to make many of the mobile home and trailer parks in California, uh, many, many of those in my own district, code compliant, and further how to decrease the burden of some of them um, that they have caused on the city, the county, and state services. Today, witnesses will be sharing opinions, experiences, and solutions for improving the current system. The focus of this hearing, a training and licensing program for on-site mobile home park managers, is suggested as one of those solutions. Managing a mobile home park, as I have found out, and probably many of you know, is very complex. And I will tell you, I have met several um, mobile home park managers who have said to me, I'm just doing the best I can. And I don't think that anyone sets out to do a bad job on anything. And certainly, if mobile home park managers are well-informed and trained, they will better be able to assist the residents. And I would like to hope that in the long run, we would have less problems going forward forward. So today I am going to show you some of the books, the Mobile Home Residency Law, the MRL. We have this one right here. My able-bodied assistant is helping me. The Mobile Home Park Acts, which is contained in the Health and Safety Code. Title 25, which is part of the State Building Code Enforcement Regulations. And I didn't hold up the MRL, but it looks, oh, there it is right here. Right here, which is kind of the Bible. It was the very first document and thing that I read cover to cover when I was elected to the State Senate because I did not have TV at my apartment. And uh, it's actually fascinating and gives you much, much good information. These are significant sets of laws that create a foundation for a well-run mobile home park. However, since it's not required for an on-site property manager to be trained, we hear of many violations, and many of them have never even seen these books. Many of them have seen the MRL, but there's so much more for them to know and be aware of. Within uh, the past year, as I've said, I have toured many mobile home parks in the district, um, and it's unfortunate to report that I have seen parks with high crime rates, trash bins that are not being emptied, uncorrected safety violations, and a culture of trespassing, to name a few problems. And as I stated earlier, most mobile home park managers are really trying to do the right thing, and in many instances, instances they just don't know what to do. Uh, and it is important to remember that not all parks 
have untrained staff. In California, we have a few professional park owners, um, park owner membership associations, which we will hear from today, that know the importance of manager training. These groups provide the very training that the legislature has required, uh, is recognized as vital to the health of California cities and counties. Some might say, well, the Senate publishes the MRL, which is available. Isn't that enough? Um, and it really is not. It is great um, for all of the quick, easy questions and answers. On pages two and three of the hearing report, you will see a list of the alleged violations by some park managers. Interestingly, you will also see a list of concerns by park employees who have contacted my staff seeking more information in an effort to at least train themselves. I think that's what stood out to me the most is these park managers really are trying to get the information so that they can do the best job possible. I would like to applaud Western Manufactured Home Communities and California Mobile, Mobile Home Park Owners Alliance for filling the obvious need for this training. Thank you very much. It is important as a legislator, I hear from all members of the mobile home park community so that we can make the best decisions possible. In the state of Oregon and Nevada, they require at least one manager of the park to complete four hours of training every two years. I'm sorry, that's the state of Oregon, the state of Nevada. They have to complete six hours of training every year. We think that it's time for California to do the same thing and have our own professional code of ethics. The question we will be seeking to answer today is, will state licensing of mobile home and trailer park managers improve the quality of life for Californians who live in these unique communities? I'd like to remind everyone today and those that are watching, if you have written testimony or a handout that you would like the select committee to be aware of, please hand it to any staff in the room. If you're staff of Connie Leva, Senator Leva, please raise your hand so you can hand any of that information to my great staff. You may also mail your testimony or comments to the office. So let us begin. Our first panel is Golden State Mobile Home Owners League. Please come forward. I am sorry, we are starting with our uh, Sergeant Davis, uh, the City of Colton Police Department. Sorry, Sergeant Davis, please come right on up. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Senator. Uh, my name is Steve Davis. I'm a sergeant with the City of Colton Police Department, and I'm here to represent the City of Colton. I do not have a presentation at this time, but I would be more than happy to answer any technical questions that you might have. Okay. So one of my questions would be, are, what are some of the challenges that you and your officers have encountered at mobile home parks in the city of Colton? We have a variety of issues. Uh, a lot of disturbances occur at these locations. Uh, one of them is, is very well known for uh, conflicts between the uh, HOA president and many of the residents there. There's a, there was a, a period where I think we were out at the location uh, probably 20 times in, in a matter of uh, 30 days. So almost daily. Yes, yes. Um, that has changed. Uh, he's no longer the uh, association president, so uh, we haven't gone out there quite as much. But we have, uh, you know, a variety of trespassing issues, uh, a lot of animal issues with uh, dogs and cats, things like that. It, it, the issue with the animals is that that there are too many, or that they're feral. Both. Okay. Both. There's there's a lot of feral cats. Um, there are. Um, stray dogs in the area. A lot of people don't take responsibility for their animals. Okay, very good. And in the 20 times that you were at this facility in 30 days, what was the nature of the calls that you were receiving? They were disputes between the um, homeowners association president and residents in the park. Uh, they were they were personality issues Got between them. Uh, he he was uh, pretty stern with how he wanted things run. If his, it was his way or the highway, uh, and they were 
basically uh, they got physical several times. A couple of people went to jail. But you, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. Please, please proceed. But yes, yeah, since since he's been uh, since he's left, uh, things have settled down quite a bit there. And he was was he also the on-site park manager? No, he wasn't. He was not. No. Was there an on-site park manager? Yes. And was he or she able? They were not able to help help out with the situation. Well, eventually they did, but it, it took quite some time for it to be resolved. And, and do you know if they if this on-site park manager had any training at all? Uh, I don't think she had any professional training. Okay. And just in your opinion, do you think that that could be helpful? Absolutely. I think it'd be okay. a big benefit. Very good. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Any other comments or anything that we could do to be helpful? No, I, I think this is a great forum to have. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to being part of it. But uh, I, I think that uh, this is a, a big step in the right direction. And I look forward to helping if I can. Right on. Well, thank you very much, Sergeant. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, those are the only questions I have. So if there's nothing else that you want to add, that would be just fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please stay. Okay. All right. Next, we are going to go with our statewide mobile home owner association. I would like to uh, bright, uh, uh, invite up Bruce Stanton, who is an attorney, uh, Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League. Bruce has been uh, an outstanding help in the uh, in the um, town halls that we have had over the past year and a half. So, Bruce, I would like to thank you very much for your willingness to help on all of these situations. Thank and you, Senator. You are quite welcome. And you brought a couple friends. So maybe uh, you yes. all can introduce yourselves. Yeah, we shall. I'm Bruce Stanton. I'm here today as corporate counsel for the Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League, which is a 52-year-old state organization of comprised of homeowners and residents in mobile home and manufactured home communities. I have with me here today two of the zone vice presidents from GSMOL. We have Ray Downing here to my Welcome, Ray. Hi, far nice right, who is the zone vice president for zone C, which is essentially Los Angeles County area all the way out to the eastern border, uh, all the way down through Orange County. Where Ray's zone ends, Tim Sheehan here, his zone begins. Tim is Hi, zone Tim. D, vice president. He's from San Marcos and covers the entire San Diego County and Palm Desert, High Desert area. Side County, Imperial County. Yeah. Big but area. Ray represents San Bernardino County in his zone. So it's good yes, to he does. Make it. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. So I brought them along. I, I, I thought I would give some, some remarks and then let them also speak to, these, uh, to this issue and give some testimony regarding what they see and hear and face daily that in their positions great. as zone vice president. That would be great. Thank um, you. As the two famous movie reviewers used to do, I would just say GSMOL gives two thumbs up, way up, <laughs> to the summary that was prepared by the committee and to this concept. Uh, we've been consistently supporting this idea for the last 15 years and participated in both of the previous kind of incarnations of this investigation and committee discussions and hearings and bills that sort of never got completely off the ground or were vetoed. Um, re all again requiring some sort of manager certification or training. Since this committee uh, hearing today was announced, we've also polled our leadership tree and obviously uh, have received very consistent responses that this is sorely needed. This from our regional managers, associate and assistant managers who are in leadership positions below the vice presidents in zones and specific parts of um, zones, or what we call regions throughout the state. Um, personally, as I've represented GSMOL for a total of about 14 years and been in this industry for over 30 years, I can also say that the list that I see on pages two and three of the summary is a very accurate list. I might add a few other things to it, such as not only do we have selective enforcement problems, but we have parks where the rules aren't enforced at all. Uh, the resale blocking can amount to things like not 
providing applications to buyers or just being so rude to prospective buyers that they just leave and don't want to buy in the park or requiring unreasonable park upgrades at the time of resale, which all of, well, at least the application part and the upgrade part really stem from, in my view, from either a lack of understanding of the mobile home residency law or perhaps an unwillingness to follow it. But I find the list to be quite accurate. Uh, another item that we've been um, encountering recently is the denial of access to the clubhouse for homeowner association or GSMOL mobile home issue types of meetings. Um, and actually Ray will have uh, a letter to actually read to you that we just received that speaks to that. So, I mean, as I look at this issue, it would seem to me that in concept, any responsible park owner and all homeowners would agree that this is a good idea. Um, be hard to find somebody who would say, we don't want managers to be trained. There's just no need to do that. Um, the issue might be, do we mandate it or how do we do it? But I think clearly the concept should be agreeable to all. I know that one park management um, um, president that I've heard recently said sometimes when they're interviewing for park manager positions, they might interview up to 20 people before they find somebody. And that I think speaks to the issue of how important this position is. I mean, the benefits to homeowners I think are obvious. One, they live in immobile homes and immobile home parks. They can't move them, very, very rarely. I think 3% of all mobile homes, once they are sighted, ever move until their final destination in the junkyard or in Elko, Nevada someplace. Um, this immobility makes residents essentially captive to a poor management situation if that exists. Secondly, they depend upon management as the primary voice and face of the park owner. That's who they see on a daily basis. And they depend upon them to provide information, enforcement, or interpretation of a lot of different laws and regulations. We've got rental agreements, which sometimes can be 30 pages or more. We have ancillary agreements such as pool, RV, pet, or arbitration agreements or clauses. We have Title 25, Code of Regulations, which is essentially the building code for mobile home parks. We have the rules and regulations of the park, which are the operating internal operating procedures for the community. We have ADA and disability related issues. We have utility related laws regarding submetering, uh, if, if we've got a submetered park for gas and electric, and even water issues can come into play. And we have federal and local housing laws, especially where we have senior parks. So we have this real complex overlay of all these different laws that could come into play. We need somebody who has at least a basic understanding that these laws exist and a basic understanding of what, in essence, the laws contain. So unlike apartment renters who are very mobile, Manufactured homeowners who are not mobile have a very significant investment in their homes, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that is a dollar investment that's at risk to some degree if we have poor management. And we have high density residential communities where quiet enjoyment is critical. And if you don't have good management, that knows how to deal with conflict resolution, the unique needs of elderly or um, families or children, the right of privacy, how to balance that, or the need for safety in the community, which is very important, especially in terms of emergency preparedness plans, um, enforcement of speeding in parks, et cetera. So that's homeowner side. Park owner side, I mean, to me, it, it would seem to be almost equally obvious. Happy residents make a better investment. I think we could all agree on that. I think we can. Following the law limits park owner liability. I mean, if I'm a park owner, why would I want a manager, a rogue outlier manager who's just making up the law as they go? And we have managers in some of the smaller parks, maybe up in the gold country or the hills especially, who you say mobile home residency law, and they're either gonna look at you and say, what's that? or I could care less. Um, and these are some of the real rogue kind of communities that don't belong to any trade association. And 
you know, following the law limits further regulation. Most of that green book that you showed everybody exists because of issues that have arisen where laws are required and have to be passed because of abuses. I don't think the arguments that have been made in the past that we should not adopt a program like this are persuasive because you simply can't compare apartment managers to the management that's required in mobile home park communities. A lot of the issues I just mentioned, um, obviously mobile home park managers have way more responsibility and um, attention that's needed to regulations. This is a consumer protection law, and I note that in the summary it talks about consumers requiring protection. We know that because the MRL cannot be waived, even if somebody wanted to, they're presumed to not have known what they were doing. And we've got things like the 72-hour rescission right, which is very similar to you know aluminum siding salesmen who go through the neighborhood and get you to sign that contract, and the next morning you look at it and go, what did I do? and you've got that right to rescind. And I think the cost of any program like this would be justified and worthwhile to a park owner because, first of all, I'm presuming it's a deductible business expense, but secondly, the better trained managers are, the more long tenured they would be, it would seem, and you'd have less need to be always hiring or firing managers and going through the expense of all of that. And with fewer problems and issues, you've got fewer legal fees. You don't have to call your attorney as often to uh, get you out of a mess that the manager got you into. Um, and as the summary points out, we have other states, very close nearby states here in the West that have less regulation. I think we probably have more regulation than any other states when it comes to mobile home parks, but they already have training in place and we don't. And you know, the question is why? So. It would be hard for me to imagine any park owner saying, I don't want my managers trained. Um, the most responsible park owners do it already, as this has pointed out. Why not all? And as long as the cost and time are reasonable, there should be consensus within the industry. I believe that this is long overdue. In conclusion, I would say, let's finally admit that there are significant problems as a result of poorly trained managers that we can bring to fruition the prior work of this committee in its prior incarnations through its previous leadership and bring this problem to uh, the legislative floor and get something passed. We know training is not going to eliminate all the problems, but I have to believe that it will be a very significant factor, go a long way to improving mobile home park living throughout the state in many parks. And we can eliminate, I think, a lot of what we're encountering by having responsible and knowledgeable and educated management. GSMOL is willing to work together with park owners to do this in the sense that you know, we started um, putting on what we called mobile home residency law road shows a few years ago where I go around and go to the different zones and with the help of leadership, we put on seminars for our residents to educate them about the MRL. And we try to do that in a responsible manner. It's not intended to be incendiary or, you know, advocating that, uh, you know, let's go sue park owners. It's to give them the basic information and prevent those kind of conflicts. But we still need legislation to bring what I would call uniformity, consistency, and um, meaningful benefit to the community as a whole. So those are my comments, and I'm really, I'll be very excited to see something actually move forward on this, and I compliment the, the senator and the committee for its interest in this issue. Um, I'd like to ask Ray Downing if he has any comments. And, and before we get to you, Ray, um, I agree with many of the things that you said, and, and as you said, the uh, the evidence and the need for regulation on two and three, I had highlighted the ones that I had seen myself when I was touring parks, and right. there are numerous. Uh, I, I had all, but I think I was able to highlight all but four that I did not actually witness or have someone tell me about. And I did not meet any mobile home park managers who had had any kind of training. One quick question I had, because I didn't had not heard of this either, and I don't think it was on the list. You just mentioned that um, residents, uh, you just got something this morning about being denied access to the clubhouse. What would be a reason for that? What would 
Well, I mean, the underlying reason from our perspective is that uh, a park owner management may wish to discourage any type of organization of homeowners wherein they would learn about their rights. And they, don't, they want to basically keep them divided or unknowledgeable. Um, the rationale given is such things as we have a schedule that you have to um, uh, you know, comport with, so you have to give us months and months in advance what dates you want to reserve the clubhouse because we have a lot of functions in here and you know, we can't bump other functions out of the way. Mr. Downing just received the letter, which is another one that we've encountered, and we've actually had to bring a couple of lawsuits regarding this, mm -hmm. where management takes the position that GSMOL is a commercial organization because when we have meetings, we invite people to become members for a $25 fee, and that even though we're nonprofit, we fall within the non-solicitation ban that the park has in its rules and regulations which from our view yeah, directly conflicts with 798.51, which I call the First Amendment rights for mobile homeowners. Um, clearly, a GSM wall membership is not a commercial solicitation. But we have a letter from Lancaster denying the ability of the chapter to use the clubhouse on that basis, saying, please reference our rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. To me, having some training that would tell a manager and hopefully up the food chain, those above, that you know the state law trumps any rule or regulation where you try to define us as a commercial organization. You know, what do you have to fear from residents you know, meeting about mobile home issues? But it's all meant to discourage and to be a chilling effect. Very good, thank you very much, Bruce. Sure. And Ray, did you have some comments or uh, questions? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, maybe I can uh, expand a little bit on, uh, first of all, on how this letter, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Eat, on, like. eat it? <laughs> no, it's not a lollipop. <laughs> uh, when we first went into this park to try to get the GSMO chapter organized, uh, the first time in, management was there. They had armed guards at the door, would not let us armed? in. Armed? Yes. Armed guards? Yes. Wow. So we had our meeting out in a, a picnic area that they had. They did not discourage us from having the meeting. So the second time we went in, uh, they let us use the clubhouse, and we organized the chapter, and a few days later, our chapter president got this letter. May I read it to you? It says, to the president of the GSMOL group, Kimberly Clarkson, that's our president of the chapter, has requested the use of the clubhouse for a meeting October 12, 2016. Unfortunately, the leadership of GSMOL has lost their privileges. You cannot solicit membership that involves money. The park does not allow solicitation of any sort, whether it be church groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, or any other groups of soliciting money to join an organization. This all falls under the solicitation sign that's posted at the front gate. The GSMOL cannot dictate to potential members with false information. They do not have the right to violate the rules of Lancaster Estates residents. This is what happened at your last meeting. Please read your MRL and park rules and regulations. Thank you, Lancaster Estates Management. Let me go back to this last sentence they had here. Uh, we did not violate any of their park rules and regulations. The manager was, came in, he just didn't like what we were talking about. And we told them that they do have to follow park rules and regulations as long as it says in the MRL, they do not conflict with the MRL. And I, and I think, Bruce, you said that this was, it was okay to meet legally on this issue in the, uh, the clubhouse. Is that correct? Well, 798.51 guarantees the right of mobile home residents to assemble for purposes related to mobile home living. Okay. 
And very seldom have we ever had a park owner take this position, I will say. This is not a, a typical position. But it is an attempt, in my view, to frustrate the 798-51 right of assembly. Got it. Um, much as we've seen attempts to stop canvassing and petitioning in mobile home parks, manager following the resident who's dropping leaflets off and picking them up behind the resident. Um, you can't use the mail tubes, only management can use the mail tubes, that kind of thing. But this is a, a more frontal attack, if you will, to say we're not even gonna allow you in the clubhouse to have this meeting. So if the manager were trained, do you know if he or she is a trained man park manager? Uh, no, I'm not, I don't know that for a fact. Yeah. Okay. So you got some of the park members here. <laughs> Very good. Then, then hopefully if this person had gone through training, they would know that it would be all right for you to do that. So this is one other thing that we can add to our list right. of reasons why park managers should be cha trained. Yeah, especially uh, when it deals with the MRL because uh, a lot of them, they have what we, I, I call it their own set of rules. That's their own little do domain, and mm -hmm. they run it like they want to run it. It's a, little of, it's a little ironic that that says, please read your MRL at yeah. the end. But now they, uh, they don't even know it themselves. <laughs> Correct. And thus the need for training. Right. Very good. Thank you, Ray. Tim, did you have any remarks? Or, and Ray, did you have anything else? Well, uh, just uh, one other thing to say uh, that I feel where they need the training to know how to manage is because as I said before, they, some of them feel this is, that's their own domain. Mm -hmm. They can run it like they want to. We have a park in, um, down the street from here, not too far, in the Highland. The manager of that park walks around with a pistol in his belt, in her belt. Well. And when you go into the office, the pistol is laying on the desk <laughs> in her office. Hmm. So these are the things where... Management, you know, that's their own little, you know, place. They own it. They run it. It's going to be run like they want to, not according to what this says. Got it. Okay. Well, that's um, very enlightening information, and I would say, again, reinforces the need for training. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Tim? Okay. Uh, as Bruce said, my name is Tim Shan. I've been a volunteer advocate for manufactured homeowners since 1996. Over Thank 50, you for that. that. Over 50,000 hours. I do it mainly for the seniors and veterans who are so vulnerable in these communities. Mm -hmm. uh, I've witnessed time and time again the arrogance of park managers. As Ray says, they think that's their domain. They can write their own law. Uh, through this training, they need to feel a greater accountability for their actions. Um, this abuse starts before people even purchase a home. Uh, in these communities uh, with unfair income requirements, uh, three or four times uh, income requirements to what the rent is, and then many verbal misrepresentations to steer them to unfair, unconscionable leases, especially in uh, jurisdictions with rent stabilization ordinances. Uh, to me as an advocate and for the benefit of seniors, uh, it would be huge if there could be an allowance for them to conceal recorders to document verbal statements made by management. There's a rational basis for seniors that have memory problems to be able to memorialize what is said to them verbally. And I think if a manager realized that there could be, they, their conversation might be recorded, they would uh, maybe uh, behave a little uh, more ethically. Uh, and so one of my goals is for the senior advocates to get that to, uh, to pass for these business type conversations. Uh, in 2012, uh, GSMO sponsored AB 2150 that led to a required notice of the rights and responsibilities that go out to the communities. I've seen very low compliance with that in uh, communities, even in my own community. Um, they send out notice of the right to request a, an MRL but not this listing mm -hmm. of the rights and responsibilities of homeowners. Uh, at the time, we hoped that there would be a further requirement that it be posted in the clubhouse. I think if we could accomplish that, and when a, a park manager says, oh, you don't have the right to request a meeting, and you could show right there on your wall, it says we have the right to meet in this clubhouse. 
uh, it would, they would feel more accountability. And that would be a, a huge accomplishment. Many homeowner, uh, many communities allow homeowner associations or GSML chapters to have a bulletin board in the clubhouse also um, to communicate, but uh, also report on the laws. I think that would help compliance of uh, park management and be a way to educate them also. Our goal is to uh, reach a level of mutual respect between homeowners and managers. Uh, sometimes that, that respect is hard earned, but that should be the goal of all of us. It's a partnership when you own a home in these communities, and some community owners are great, but others, like Spin say, they, they think it's the wild, wild west and they can do whatever they want, and especially the seniors are, are being very severely impacted. Uh, one of my other hopes is that we could create a, a, an easier mechanism to file elder abuse and exploitation claims with district attorneys. The, many of them have elder abuse divisions, but they require uh, homeowners to file com uh, police reports, and it, it doesn't seem to be a good fit for the type of complaints that homeowners have if they get a notice of a, a $600 a month rent increase. Do they file a police report when they get that 90-day notice or what? And so um, they would feel more accountability and there would be a mechanism to uh, train uh, managers if there was uh, a greater opportunity to uh, prosecute them and investigate them on the grounds of elder abuse and exploitation. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a couple questions, but Bruce, did you have a comment? Um, go ahead and ask your questions. Okay. I was going to make one more comment. I, I was going to ask, um, it's for really for all of you, um, what you would say the top five alleged violations and state laws and regulations um, occur in these mobile home parks. What, what are you hearing mostly from the residents? But, okay, uh, one of the main things I always hear is uh, goes back to the managers who feel that the park is theirs and they are violating their own park rules and regulations, thinking that uh, they can do what they want to do. But according to the MRL, it states in there that management uh, has to follow the same rules and regulations as the residents. Mm -hmm. but they refuse to do it in a lot of cases, and but they make their own rules to give to the uh, residents to where, you know, they are keep, to keep them more or less under thumb. Got it. Other issues, Tim? Um, yeah, I, I think with this trend from the mom-and-pop owners to the corporate owners, mm. uh, there's there's been um, a, a, an enabling of managers to be more rogue and do things without the knowledge of the, the community owner necessarily. Uh, we have some people from Escondido here several years ago. I know the manager of a few uh, uh, communities uh, uh, told, well, one particular community, uh, there's a huge tree on, on a homeowner's lot, said, you need to, to uh, remove that tree. And uh, it's going to cost, I forget how much it was, $1,600 or some huge amount. Um, oh yeah, but... Uh, um, and, but if you do it today, we can maybe get someone to do it for eight hundred dollars or so, something like that. <laughs> right, and there you. was certainly the impression that the, the manager was getting that money. Right. Uh, it was the responsibility of the community owner to remove a tree uh, that was a hazard, um, and things uh, with driveways and other things, uh, uh, predatory towing, uh, where they might. You know, I don't have hard evidence, but certainly there's been several uh, suspicions that the, the manager works a deal with uh, towing companies. And uh, I've seen myself, they'll swoop in, they give no notice to the homeowner, um, and they'll try to drive off uh, as a way to m make money. Mm -hmm. And um, my belief is that some of these managers are benefiting uh, financially without the community owner not even knowing. Very good, thank you. I have heard that myself. Bruce? I made a quick list of five. It's a little, I mean, wow. It's like, you know, what are your favorite five songs of all time? It's a tough <laughs> list to maybe come up with. 
but I, I would say with, I'm thinking you've heard more than I have. I, <laughs> I can think of my five, but I have uh, not been doing this as long as you. I would say the five would be um, interfering with resales, and again, that could be you know denying applications, being rude, um, unreasonable upgrade requests, something that would, uh, would that would be designed to frustrate resales, denying access to clubhouse, as we've talked about for what I call First Amendment rights. Unequal enforcement of rules or no enforcement at all. Um, and that kind of cuts both ways, you know, because you can have residents coming in and saying, please enforce the rules. And you have other residents saying, why are you enforcing the rules against me? Right. Um, and, and there's an area where if a, a well-trained manager and park management is committed, they can actually work with the homeowners and say, you know, you guys help us to enforce the rules. Um, and I've, I've actually represented or been involved with some parks that have good organizations of residents, like an E-Core group or something that actually assists with that. Number four, um, changing rules without proper notice and using what are called policies to enforce um, conditions or actions. It's not, maybe it's not a rule, but it's a policy, which obviously is not defined anywhere. So maybe that means there's no rule. And number five would be seven day notices, eviction notices that are given for all kinds of reasons or just not proper, you know, under the code. So, I mean, those would be sort of the top five. The other comment I, that I thought I should make in closing is uh, about two years ago, our organization began a series of meetings with WMA um, and, and developed what we call a best practices committee, where among other things, we are discussing issues, trying to see if there are issues that can be informally resolved or that we can agree upon that might even go to legislative resolution like the disposal law that went into the MRL this year. But also writing articles that we call best practices articles that each of our associations publishes in our newsletters on topics like the clubhouse and ve vehicular issues in parks, the, the two that I can uh, most recently think of, to try and put out into the industry what we feel mutually are the best practices that hopefully Great managers idea. would read yeah. as well as residents to again try to supplement this and not just say, we're gonna just sit back and let somebody else do it all. I mean, we wanna be proactive, so. They're very good. I So you didn't say either of the two things that I heard the most, but you've been doing this longer than I have. I hear a lot from folks, um, the number one thing on page two, unexplained charges on their utility bills. Wow. Uh, I think I've heard it's that big. in almost every p park that I toured. It's and big. then the other issue that I heard is not having a safe space or even like a green space for children to play. Uh, a lot of these mobile home parks were all asphalt and there was no place for the kids to play other than maybe right where their, their parents happen to live. So those are two things that I heard um, quite a bit. And I would say another one would be um, drug-related, crime-related conditions yes. in the park that management is clearly overwhelmed by and really doesn't know how to deal with. And maybe they're not getting the support they need from park owner or off-site management, but they're just overwhelmed. Yes, and, Tim? yes, if I could add that many of these communities uh, were built as 55 and older communities and mm. converted to all age without any requirement to add playgrounds for children Got or it. added parking, uh, upgrades to the infrastructure. And so that's impacted a, a lot of communities. And I, I would also add the state of Arizona has a program that allows either the community owners or the state a homeowner advocacy group to conduct training uh, for managers. So you might look Very into good. that. Uh, also. Uh, very good. I have uh, one, one other question for this panel, and s some opponents of, cha of uh, training for park managers have said, well, if we're going to have training for park managers, we should also have training for park residents. I don't think that's a terrible idea. Curious uh, what you gentlemen think about that. I'm all for it. And uh, having periodic, uh, like maybe when you move into a certain community and there's sort of a, a new resident meeting where they're describing the activities or the events or the rules of the community. Um, I mean, that sounds great. 
the, okay. the more information, in my view, that's out there and the more communication, the better. And that's why we're committed to try to as well give information to our members. What do you guys think? Uh, a few years ago, we incorporated a 501c3 oh, okay. education fund oh, okay. uh, that's an affiliate of GSMOL. Ray and I are both on the board as well as Mary Jo uh, uh, Bertich uh, here. And so we would welcome the opportunity uh, to reach out to more homeowners. We have uh, an educational blog already, a website that homeowners can go to okay. uh, to educate themselves on the mobile home residency law and Title 25. And so I think we're most fully supportive of that. And if you have any grant money that might be available <laughs> to, to support that, that C3, we would welcome that. Let me find my checkbook. Okay. Stephanie's <laughs> retiring, so she's got lots of money. You, oh, yes. Uh, you, One of the main <laughs> things that we try to achieve when we go to these parks, and this is basically all we want to do is educate them on the laws. Mm-hmm. Now, when we have, like, say, for instance, this letter I read, when management is talking against the laws and saying things that's not true, uh, and the intimidation that they ha- you know, have toward the people, people feel they're intimidated when the manager comes to them and says, you don't believe this, you don't listen to this. That tends to defeat what we're trying to do because the people are afraid of losing their homes. Sure, absolutely. So this is, uh, again, maybe another thing we could add to that list as to why we need managers schooled and trained in how to be a manager. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Is there any parting comments you wanted to make? Or are you good? I was just going to mention, I'm glad to mention the 501c3. We've just developed a draft thing called an MRL master exam oh. that we're going to try to put together so that residents can actually go and take a test and hopefully learn about the MRL that way. So Send it to me. I'd like to take the test. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. We appreciate your time and all thank your you efforts. Thank you Thank you. All right, our next uh, panel is a statewide mobile home park owners association. I would like to invite up Catherine Borg, legislative advocate of Western Manufactured Home Communities. And Dick Basir, who has been quite an ally and very helpful in all of the town halls that we have had. Vicki Talley, advisory board member of California Mobile Home Park Owners Alliance. Very happy to have all three of you with us today. Welcome. Hi. Catherine, do you get to start? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here today in San Bernardino. You are quite welcome. We're always happy to have people in San Bernardino and the IE. Um, Okay, so I'm Catherine Borg with the Western Manufactured Housing Communities Association. I've been working for them for the last 15 years. Um, WMA has been around since 1945 and is the um, biggest trade association representing mobile home park owners in the state of California. Um, We have uh, approximately 1,800 members. And that is of the state's reported 4,556 parks. And then lot spaces statewide in the state would be 452,675 spaces. So that's- Say that one more time. 452,675. Those are active- A lot of folks. Active uh, places. Um, But those are from, you know, soup to nuts as far as, you know, anything that's over two spaces is considered a mobile home park. Um, We have places that have, you know, 800 plus spaces. We have places that are, you know, five and six and very rural, Um, you know, not anything, anything like this to to come to, to, uh, to get some kind of training. So again, let me thank you for having us here today to talk about improving mobile home parks through education and licensure of property managers. Um, WMA has a premier program in the state, and um, it's a voluntary program that we created in response to something like this back in uh, 1988. Our program was established in about 1991. Um, 
And I just wanted to go over with you some of the things that we require as far as our, our training is concerned. It's a certificate program. It's not a licensure program. Um, I want to point out that in the other states that were brought up, those, those states have an educational requirement, like an education hours. They are not licensed. They are not Correct. certified. They are just... You come, you sit, you listen, you leave. So our program is, is quite different. Um, we require if you're gonna get a MCM certificate that you will get 60 units and each unit is equated to about an hour. Um, you have an exam and if you do not pass, you do not get the units. Um, they are able to um, you know, retest to get those units, but each session consists of about 60 units. It takes approximately somebody two and a half years to get their MCM certificate. Um, they would have to get recertified after every two years, and they have to require to get 18 units again in the next two years, but they must take, they are mandated to take the new laws seminar every year in which they are certified. They'll get a pin. Um, some people have been around for a long time. Currently, we have approximately 600 um, MCM uh, recipients. Those are people who are, you know, currently certified. They, you know, people have, you know, lapsed and have gone on, and, um, but that's our current number. Our program is available to both members of WMA and non-members of WMA. Our cost um, is, is not small. Uh, it costs about $200 for each training. And, and the man, park manager pays for that? Probably their boss or their the corporate owner. pays for that. Some people do pay for it on their own. They consider that, um, that a plus for themselves. But it's, you know, it's, not, it's not cheap. No, and, not um, So 60 units, and you say that's about how many hours, 60 hours? It's, it would be about 60 hours. Okay, at $200 per two hours? Yeah. That is a little pricey. Or two hundred dollars for uh, usually like a six unit. Six unit. Yeah. Okay, got it. So about two thousand dollars. So and if they um, for the so like for example this year the new law seminar cost about two hundred nine dollars. The bundle if they we have a series of programs that happen, and um, you can get those for like one hundred and sixty three dollars each. Um, let me go through with you some of the things that we've done over the last couple of years. So in night in two thousand fifteen. We did um, a disaster preparedness plan. Um, we, in May, had done a technology and tenancy program. Um, August was mental health first aid. Obviously, I think you understand we've seen a lot of um, mental health issues come up throughout the state, uh -huh. and that has been a, a big issue that we've had in some of our communities, and I'm sure the guy from Colton can uh, attest to that. Sergeant Davis. Um, <laughs> so in uh, 2016, we had business best practices from office management to customer relations. Um, we, in May, had maintenance infrastructure, drought-resistant landscaping, and keeping your park healthy. In August, we had a paid speaker that um, did some seminars on fair housing and solutions. But again, I, you know, a lot of the issues that come up, these complaints, and I think you hear them today, a lot of them is not that they don't know the law, it's that, you know, I think sometimes customer relations um, are, are, not, are not good on both sides. Do you ever, do any of the trainings ever include conflict resolution? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we, we've done that. We've done that in the past. I think that, in my personal opinion, I think conflict resolution for every park manager would be like at the top of the list. I think conflict resolution for everybody in the United in States would yes. be a good, <laughs> good thing to have. Agreed. Um, you know, our program is really good, but um, I would probably say that it's probably not the most, you know, important thing here that could be done to help improve um, mobile home parks in the state of California. Um, it would be very difficult for the state to come down and, and say that every single park manager, every single park in the state of California should be, you know, have some required training just because of the diversity that we have here in the state um, as far as locations and abilities. Um, it's just, it's going to be very difficult. We still have some parks that, um, 
you know, a fax machine would probably be considered high technology. So um, just because of, of where they are. Mm -hmm. And they don't really need it. You know, we have 82-year-old managers that I don't think any of the residents would complain about that are the sweetest things that, you know, they just, you know, come and make the coffee and they collect the rent checks and everything is good. But, you know, that person is not going to want to get in a car and travel four hours for a mandatory training. That person would probably decide to retire. Um, right. And, and I think that's the hard part, right? Because you do have that 82-year-old nice guy who's going to, you know, bring you coffee and, and whatnot. But in the 10 parks that I visited, I only met one manager that kind of had an idea of what they were doing. The rest of them were completely lost. Now, it's only 10, so I know that's a very small sample. But, you know, I think I, my concern is that there are more managers that aren't a nice guy or gal and that they, if they had the training, they could better run it would just be better for everybody they could better run the park and the residents would do what they were supposed to do as well yeah I, I understand that you know oftentimes sometimes people know the law they apply it differently so for example um, it took me a week to convince the county of uh, Riverside in their uh, environmental safety um, department that the mobile home park kitchen was not a food facility <laughs> They wanted to regulate that as a food facility. They wanted to uh, shut down the bereavement group that was meeting there. Um, the pancake breakfast, they didn't want to occur. Um, they were very concerned about the, the health and safety of that facility and wanted to charge them a, a, a permit and wrote them a cease and desist. So after you know many hours and days of prompting them to ask them, where do you cite your regulatory authority for this, they finally realized that they didn't have regulatory authority for this. So sometimes even though they know the law and they're doing it in earnest, they might sure. apply it differently. Um, our recommendation would be that we focus on programs that could enhance what are out there right now. So for example, there's a mobile home ombudsman program that the state of California is required to um, have. Um, there is somebody there that is supposed to answer questions and help to resolve um, complaints. Some of the things that they are supposed to do is provide assistance in taking complaints, helping to resolve and coordinate the resolution of those complaints. Um, and they're even supposed to you know, offer advice on uh, problems relating to the mobile home residency law. Um, the ombudsman's not supposed to arbitrate or provide legal advice, but I still think that uh, my understanding is that that position might be able to um, do more in the line of helping to resolve problems um, before they get to, to this point in time. We would be more than willing to help work with HCD to help create some kind of tools mm -hmm. um, to, I think we had, with Orange County Group, we had had a, uh, a complaint form that was very beneficial. It you know took in a lot of very detailed information. I think sometimes, you know, on the the use of the clubhouse issue, I think some people just need to be reminded of what the law is and what they can and when they can't do. But I'm not sure if uh, you know mandating manager education statewide is, is the most effective way to um, resolve that issue. I would agree that we could probably do more with the Ombuds person program, um, maybe make it a little more robust. I know that I've had people call and then call us and say we didn't get any answers. We I have not found people to find it terribly helpful, and I think that creates a little more work for uh, our consultant here because uh, she ends up with more of the calls. So I, I think we could do more with with the ombuds person program. I mean, we also take a lot of calls at WMA and we refer out. Um, I have to say that the uh, mobile home residency law book that, that your committee puts together is extremely helpful. One of the things that has been very helpful is that frequently asked questions. Yes, um, yes They're I seen agree. as third party answers to those questions because sometimes, you know how it is, it's like you're, you're, you're looking for an answer and you know, you ask the mobile home park owners and they're going to say, the resident's going to say, well, that's not right because it's coming from you. Right. But I know. if the same thing, we, you know, we bring them out and, you know, here, here's the answer. Senate Select Committee says, and it's like, oh, okay, they'll, they'll take that answer. Right. Um, we also use the back of this booklet. Every single county is um, portrayed here with their adult protective services, um, legal services, 
um, all kinds of things that are extremely helpful. That I think could be, you know, enhanced, used more on the on the mobile home on the mobile home ombudsman site. Um, then again, I think one of the more effective ways to to handle some of these issues that we have is um, the issue of giving us the tools that are necessary to evict bad residents. It's one of these issues that um, WMA and GSMO have talked about in their, um, in, their, in their group meetings together, but we have not quite come to a resolution on what that solution is. Part of the issue is that um, there's an, a section of the Mobile Home Residency Law 798.56b, and that section has to do with substantial annoyance. And to get us to evict certain people in the park, we need to have certain witnesses that are willing to sign on and give out those names, and those are public for 60 days to the person that you want to evict. We came very close to a resolution, except that GSMOL believed that um, the, the new section should not apply to um, management or the employees of the, of the park. The problem is management has been the target of many of these you know, harassment things. Um, residents have beat up our managers. We've had to get temporary restraining orders. Um, they, they're afraid just as much as some of the other residents in the community. But we believe that you know, it should apply that if the violence is against a park manager or a park employee, that we should be able to evict that person. Um, I pulled off just a couple of the many, many um, articles that I have found over the years on uh, resident um, harassment. This one, uh, man allegedly shoots mom's turtle, creates standoff in North County. Uh, man shot the mother's turtle before making threats of deadly violence and had, um, he wanted to be uh, killed by the, the police officer. Said so authorities said Nelson had caused many disturbances in the mobile home park previously. So would training of the park manager help this situation? No. Okay. What we need is tools to be able to evict people like this guy who, you know, wanted to, uh, to kill the turtle. And, and um, are the tools that you're looking for like legislative tools? Is yes. that what you mean? Okay. We need enhancements in the mobile home residency law in that civil code to be able to evict bad tenants. I believe, you know, when this, when that section was created, the idea is, you know, you had a lot of senior communities, you know, everyone was abiding by, Everyone was abiding by the rules, and you know, in, in earnest, you know, most people wanted to to do the right thing. But you know, over the years, with you know, mental health issues, with you know, communities have that have become more family oriented. You have people moving back into the family house. Um, you know, residents come to us and say, "Please evict this guy. Please get rid of the. Can, can't you do anything?" It's like, yeah. no, we we can't do anything because that resident has decided that that person's their caregiver. Mm. Um, and you know, we, then we're, our hands are tied, we can't do anything. Um, can you evict that person? They have you know, four barking dogs. Well, that person claims that one is their pet and three are their service animals. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, we had this guy who, who just is going to jail, he was the um, guy that did the voice for Charlie Brown. He's just been uh, sentenced to four years and eight months in prison for threatening the former park, mobile home park manager and trying to threaten Sheriff Bill Gore. Um, he also harassed other residents in the mobile home park. You know, training is great, but training's not gonna get to the, the issue that um, we think is gonna serve the residents of the state of California best. Um, we'd like to see you know, something like that go forward first. Um, um, Mr. Stanton brought up their bill on the, the, the tenants, um, you know, 10 best things. And he, they had a resident that came in to um, testify his reasoning for wanting to have that top 10 list. And the reason was, is that they came into the park, they were very excited, 
Yes, they got all this information that the park manager told them that they needed to read, and they never read it. Hmm. So again, when you talk about, you know, we have, you know, a seven-day rescission notice for something. We have a three-day rescission notice for something. But if people don't read the information that's given to them, it, you know, it doesn't work. No, it's a challenge, absolutely. We all know situations uh, where people are given information and they don't read it. Yeah. Um, so, and, and you know what, Catherine, I'm always willing to look at, at things and we can talk further about um, evictions and, and what that looks like. I'm, I'm always willing to look at, we have a lot of issues within mobile home parks. I think that um, what we're talking about today is one uh, of many. And certainly we, while we don't want residents being harassed, we don't want park managers being harassed as well. So I, uh, I take everything you've said into account. I've taken some notes. Was there anything else you wanted to add before we um, move on to I'd like to uh, introduce Vicki Talley. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Vicki Talley. I'm on the board of directors of the California Mobile Home Park Owners Alliance. And also I've been the executive director of the Manufactured Housing Educational Trust uh, for over 30 years, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that organization covers this region, the Inland Empire, San Bernardino Riverside counties, and Orange County. And in that 30 years of time, I've had considerable experience sitting down and meeting with park owners, managers, and residents. And one thing I can say through that extensive experience is there's a lot of miscommunication, misunderstanding. One of the I things we did in the city of Huntington Beach was that we came up with a dispute resolution uh, program, uh, basically saying and advising the mobile home park residents that if you have an issue in your park, here are the steps that you follow. And that means you go to the manager first, park owner, that doesn't work, you call the our organization, we sit down, put together a meeting with the park owner and the residents, and I can tell you that through that program, we've resolved many, many disputes. And again, it is just a uh, misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, I think the, the suggestion that both park owners, managers, and residents all need education was absolutely great. <laughs> that is the key. We do everything we can to provide that education through CMPA and through MET. We provide uh, an, uh, a hotline, a 24-7 hotline, to answer questions to supplement the ombudsman's program. CMPA focuses primarily on the owners. We totally support WMA's education program. It's an outstanding program. We educate and work with the owners of the mobile home parks primarily. And obviously, the owners need to be aware, pass that on down to their managers, and adopt policies that comply with the regulations and rules at hand, and of course, the laws at hand. We never want to, um, and I can tell you that there isn't a mobile home park owner around that wants to intentionally violate a rule. I agree with you. I think they're all <laughs> trying to do the best they can. Right, or have a manager violate a rule. So there's misunderstandings, there's personalities, and I think we've given good examples of that. Catherine did a great job of that. I want to reiterate that I've had an opportunity over the years to become close with the um, executive director of the Oregon Mobile Home Park Owners Association and the Nevada Mobile Home Park Owners Association and had an opportunity to touch basis with them regarding their programs. And, you know, they don't license, they don't provide certificates, they don't do testing. In Oregon, the, the question, because I read, you know, the report and the complaints, and one of my questions was, has this reduced the number of complaints? that you've had in your state. You know, and the response was no, it hasn't. And so I think that's an, you know, it's an interesting um, uh, challenge, if you will. The other thing I think it's very, very important, you know, I heard a lot of talk about, well, there were comments today about rogue park owners, and of mm -hmm. course, Catherine related to our, our small parks throughout the state who have very few spaces and mom, mom and pops or elderly managers, whatever. Uh, but by and large, we have evolved where we have very sophisticated park management companies providing very specific services to park 
uh, owners. And Mr. Brashear has one of those premier companies. And the, I think it's just an incredible service that these, organi these professional management companies and, if you will, the corporate owners who manage their properties. And these folks are very, very careful about making sure that their managers know the law, abide by the law, and are very, very much on top of that. The last thing they want is to have a lawsuit <laughs> on anything. So I think, I, I, I want to say that it seems to me that some of these complaints are the exception and not the rule. And I would like to offer to you uh, even more extensive tour of mobile home parks. Oh, I plan on it. It's just okay. finding the time. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we are more than happy. We, you know, it, do a lot of work in this area. Would love to introduce you to some uh, more broad range, and I think probably more typical. So, in closing, absolutely great. have to support uh, Catherine's comments on providing tools to park managers and park owners. It's, it's really difficult when you have a park resident complaining about their neighbor, again, the barking dog, whatever it is, and we have no tools to evict. That's not a management training issue. That's, a, that's an issue that we don't have the ability under the current law. So these are so important to us. Um, in, I, in my concluding remarks, we're going to say, please join us on a tour. So I'll just offer that again. <laughs> Very good. And I would love to. I absolutely would love to. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. Before we move over to Dick, I just wanted to um, comment when you talked about Oregon and uh, Arizona, that it has not reduced their complaints. I think in my mind, when I think about park managers being trained, I don't know that it will reduce complaints because I think when people live around each other, work around each other, there's always going to be complaints. My hope would be would be to reduce violations. So in management training, re reduce violations that are happening in the parks versus just the complaints. And that's a good point. And if I said Arizona, I meant Nevada. I and, apologize. And I said yeah. the wrong thing. You that's said okay. the right thing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, and I would like to know more about the dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. I think that that is always important. And does CMPA train? How, how do you, you, you've just done it there in Huntington Beach, I think you said? Oh, no. No, that was through the Manufactured Housing Educational okay. Trust, closely, working closely with the city and the park owners in that city. And we did the dispute resolution. It's a, a volunteer. Voluntary, obviously, this is what you do and you follow, but I'll be very, very happy to provide you with that. We've done that in other cities as well. And how do how does someone sign up for that? Do you, do you guys kind of go on the road, so to speak, and, and uh, train uh, park managers or residents, or do you just wait until an issue comes up? How, does, how, do, how do you do that? Well, the city actually uh, took part in distributing that information to the okay. residents. We've distributed as an organization to all of the park owners. And, um, it's it, kind of city by city? In this case, this particular one was in Huntington Beach. Okay. And but if example um, that I'm giving. If some of the folks here were interested, how would they just contact you or how would they Absolutely. get that training? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, great. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Dick Brasier, how are you? Welcome. I'm good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I wasn't uh, planning on participating, I was just gonna follow up on a couple of things. But I think a couple of very important things that we need to get to is the Senate Select Committee over the years was developed to just handle exactly what we're sitting here talking about, trying to find resolution to problems, specifically originally in Orange County. And what happened, that's why you got this new civil code that you folks put out, which has got to be one of the greatest things. And if the people would just read this, it would stop about half the problems. Because uh, when I relate our people to this, may to this booklet where you can read it. Uh, the problem is in the state of California, as I think you understand, we have to issue California Civil Code, okay? And so, but the problem is you can't read it because it's, it's too small. So when you go to read it, this is the Bible as far as I'm concerned. You can tell mine gets worn and I give mine out half the time. So there's some on your back desk back here. So if there's any residents that don't have a copy, they should get a copy. Definitely, we think it's the Bible too. <laughs> The other thing that you know, that doesn't get published enough too is that the committee at one time came up with a resolution form of, of standard complaint form that we suggested to be used. It was used in Orange County. There were several park owners that have volunteered to use it in all their parks. We actually use it in over 70 of our communities in the state of California. And it's one of those that where the residents can complain or suggest the, uh, items to management. If they don't get resolution, then it goes to the owner, mm. 
and or to the management company and then to the owner and there's double copies and it's a form that came up and if you read just the what the terminology on it is it'll resolve a lot of the things that we're sitting here talking about today if people would just use that to start with okay and it's a great form to use we give it out in all our communities i know bill swinesworth we gave it out on the, all of his communities um, norm mcadoo gave it out on the, all of his communities and so we used it and uh, as the pilot case in the county of orange county at one time and i would strongly suggest that gets used mobile home park management guys is common sense and the problem is is trying to find people that will honestly run communities with common sense you know, and show respect for each other. The biggest problem that we see constantly is the lack of common sense for managers. I'm one of the people that will tell you, we probably interview 20 couples to find one couple that we will hire. Uh, because if I sit there and I'm interviewing them and I get them in an argument with each other, you can imagine what they're gonna do when they're dealing with residents, okay? Uh, so we do go through a process that takes a very long time sometimes in trying to find uh, your right management. On your list of, um, of items that cause the biggest problems, guys, mm -hmm. you got to put selective enforcement at the top of that list because that's the biggest Sele selective enforcement, enforcement by of rules management by managers because it's the selective enforcement of sometimes they say they play favorites, sometimes it's selective enforcement because they don't understand the law in total, so they'll go after something they think they know better than somebody else. So you know, selective enforcement is one thing that you guys really do have to address this issue about training. Okay, we do, none of our people go to the CM programs. We do our own training uh, within our company. We do it once a year and we go through all the things and one of the things that's in every year is PR, is public relations with, that we try and uh, instill in our managers that it's really an important factor of running a community, is the PR aspect. To say that you have to be certified or you have to take a license or any of those things, honestly, everybody can run for a test and study for a test and get it passed. I think, you know, this thing about training where you have to sit there and you do have to listen, you are going to pick up something in that whole process. So having continuing education hours where people do have to listen to something, whether you do it over the Internet now, which is really a lot easier to do and a few other things, that I think there's things that would be really beneficial that managers could pick up from that. But again, I think, you know, to say that you're going to have to license them, do you guys realize you don't have to have a manager in a community under 50 spaces? Mm -hmm. That's state which, law. Which is kind of a problem, but that's that a is, discussion it creates, for another day. It creates day. a major problem, especially yeah. if you own the utility systems and you do all these things. I mean, but that's been the law forever. Yeah. So one of the problems that you're faced with is, and do you realize, I mean, when she's sitting here quoting the number of spaces that are left in the state of California, Okay, with only 452,000 spaces left, spaces are going out of business. I mean, they're saying, okay, we are not going to stay in this business anymore. And so when you're sitting there saying, so the average space of park in the, the state of California now is less than 90 spaces. It's less than 90 spaces. So when you're starting to think about these parks that are, you know, two, three, four, or 500 spaces, that means there's all these parks that are under 50 spaces, and it does create a problem because how do you get to them? There's nobody on site. There's nobody that's responsible. How do you get to those owners? And if you come up with some kind of a program, that's the ones you need to address because they're some of the people that are causing some of the bigger problems. I probably take, on average, 10 to 15 calls from different park managers or residents of other communities that aren't even ours in regards to ongoing issues, how do we handle certain things and stuff. And again, there's a lot of people like me out there that have been in the business. I'm 73 years old and I started when I was 15, so I've been in the business a long time. So trying to sit there and make the business better, there's several of us out there that do that and we'll take those calls and try and help out. And the people from Gizmo will sit here and tell you, they know if they can have somebody call me and I will mm -hmm. make the phone call and try and go beat on somebody's head. If, like if I can find out who is carrying the gun, I guarantee you they will have a phone call from me. That would be wonderful. Thank you. I'm and sure I, that, uh, <coughs> is Ray still here? Did he leave? I'm sure we could find out who that is. There gonna, you are, Ray. He's going to fill me in. We, okay, we, very we, good. I saw him outside, right? Good. I was uh, thinking I might want to go and talk to that gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, oh, it's a lady. Even more fun. <laughs> But, but the issues about, you know, uh, what Catherine also said about these really, the really bad residents that we can't do anything about, where these residents think, why does it take so long to take care of this and stuff, right? It is. Our process gets really long in the state. 
of Nevada, if you have, if you know it's a drug dealer or suspect it's a drug dealer, I can have that person out of my park in five days. Hmm. In five days, just on suspicion. Got it. Okay. Okay. So the the, the thing is about some of the laws, the pendulum always swings too far. Okay. And I guess you know what? We're half the cause of this. We are the owners of the of the communities and stuff because we didn't listen. We're not good listeners. In every seminar I ever done, have done, I've always said the best on-site manager is somebody with elephant ears and a pin head. Because if you listen <laughs> enough, you're probably going to learn something. So, you know, I can sit here on behalf of WMA. that We try. Uh, we have a convention coming up that has uh, programs that are trying to do this on behalf of Vicki Talley. I've known her for years. Orange County, you never hear much out of. Well, it's because... You know, she's also involved in Orange County. And so they've put these programs together that have seemed to work. And so if we can take the best part of those programs, that's probably a good, you know, a good start for what we really need to do. Uh, but again, uh, anything that we can do to help, uh, you know, we're here to answer questions and, yeah. and no, assist. I, I appreciate that. And you've been very helpful at all of the town halls we've had. I thank you. Dick, how does the program work um, for your managers? The the program that you, the training that you put on, do the managers sign up? What happens if they don't attend the training? Is there any enforcement? <laughs> they, they won't work for me very long. Uh, <laughs> they're, re, they're required to participate. It could be a job requirement. I have requirements <laughs> in my job. Uh, <laughs> We require them to come and participate in face-to-face -face, uh, seminars at our once a year when the new laws come out. Mm -hmm. We wait, usually do it in the end of January or the first week in February because one of the things we do, we always do new laws to start with, but Very then good. we always either have an attorney come in or a, pers a PR person come in or somebody else to do some training. Um, even the utility stuff, sometimes we do utility training because that's become a huge, Big issue. huge, huge issue. And this thing about where you say whether people are being charged inappropriately and stuff, I mean, our managers are trained in regards to saying, okay, if somebody comes in and complains about a meter, here's what you do, here's what you do. I've put together a manager's manual several years ago. WMA actually has a manager's manual. You st <laughs> still have a manager's Probably. <laughs> I still think they still have a manager's manual. But we put a manager's manual together several years ago, and we require our managers to sit down and read it, you know, and hopefully it has the things that you're sitting here talking about. It has a section on PR, how to handle certain things, how to handle emergencies. And I think, you know, if that was something that could be published and, and it would be helpful to anybody, even if it was a 50 space park, because you know Absolutely. by law now we're supposed to have certain things like a disaster plan. We have to have these things now uh, as part of the, the law that's been written, okay? And I think you know if even if you had the checklist of what those things were that you had to have, that might be beneficial. Um, so if I'm a park manager for you and I don't go to the training, what happens to me? Uh, you better have a good excuse, number one, and it's medical usually is the only thing that won't be there because uh, we actually fly you down or oh. whatever the case may be. We, our parks are all over the state of California, and we usually have the seminar in Southern California. So it is somewhat mandatory. It is mandatory. It is mandatory. Okay, very good. Okay. So if we don't license or we don't train managers, you know, I think everything that all of you have talked about is all of it's helpful and all of it's good stuff. But if we don't require manage, um, park managers, 50 spaces or more, to be trained, wh what do we do? What, what do we do? I think, you know, the, the situation that you just sat here and said is I don't think it's a licensing where you have to go pass a test or you do something. I think if you make it mandatory that you have to take some kind of hours Okay, I think that would that's a reasonable request to be very truthful. Okay, Catherine, what do you think? Um, on behalf of uh, WMA's legislative committee and the board, I'm not authorized to say that we would support <laughs> anything in that regard. Got it. Um, I, I think that um, I think the point that that Dick makes is really um, good, is and I think that's where we came from with some of the other uh, bills that we've had before us on mandated training is that there's a lot of companies out there, a lot of big management companies that do their own training. And we, you know, we wouldn't want to say that you have to take training from WMA, or that you have to take training from um, the Met, or you have to take training from some statewide trade association. If there is a good management company like Dick's, like you know, um, you know Jim Joffe's group, you know a lot of these other groups, they have their own training. They're very adequate. 
They, they teach the right things. They get to their people. Obviously, if you don't attend those trainings, you probably get fired. Um, that's a pretty big, pretty big internal hammer. So um, I would hate to say that, you know, there would be a bill out there that said you had to take it from a certain group. Right. No, I understand what you're saying. So if we make it mandatory, how do we enforce it? Um, very good question. Um, you know, in this, I wanted to bring up these numbers. So in the state of Nevada, you know, great. There's 400 parks hmm. in the state of Nevada. It's a little bit easier to, uh, to follow up on and figure out who's got their certificate up or not. Um, I think in, in Arizona, you know, they only have 1,400 parks. Well, it's the sixth largest economy. We do have challenges in the state of California. Yeah. Um, but what I, again, what I get back to is that, you know, with our, with our 4,500 parks, I mean, there's a, even more with the RV parks and whether you consider those, you know, communities or not in this regard. You know, who is going to go up to Del Norte County to make sure that, you know, Betty Sue has her five hours of, of manager training? And, you know, maybe Betty Sue is the greatest, you know, park manager on earth and she's got no complaints from her residents. Um, I don't think that the state of California has enough money right now to follow up on making sure that those people have that sort of training. We would support um, the MPM program is coming up for renewal very soon. We need, to, we need to look at renewing that. We need more enforcement of the health and safety codes in the mobile home parks more then we need enforcement of whether the manager has a certain amount of hours of, of training or not. I, I absolutely don't disagree with you about the health and safety, but for me, that goes to the training. A lot of the managers I talked to didn't know what to do when they had feral cats and we had a park that had a typhus outbreak. The, the managers didn't know what the law was and what they could do about those cats. So I think the health and safety ties directly back to whether or not the manager is trained and knows what where we, I mean, the problem for the manager was they didn't know who to call, what to do. Do I call the health department? Do I call the city? Do I call HCD? Who do I talk to? I think training would have helped them with that situation. You know, I think there's always going to be very unique circumstances that come up that a manager is not going to know who to call at that time, and they're going to have to know who to call to find out that answer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get new issues that come up all the time, like this food facility issue. I. I didn't know. I had to go back and I had to research. I, I didn't know the law. Um, I, I don't think I would know what to do with feral cats, right. but I would probably have to, you know, I'd call somebody, have common sense enough to call somebody to, what do I do with these feral cats? Right. You know, can I shoot them? You know? <laughs> um, you can't, maybe not. but the health uh, part, or the uh, Humane Society can right. dispose of them. Well, maybe that gal with the gun can come in and take care of your feral cats. I, but, I think the point I'm trying to make is just knowing some basic things, because we can't teach common sense. Some people have more of it true. than others. And you, can't, we, and you can't tell people that they need to read something. Right. Because they don't. Um, but and, hopefully if they're trained... I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying on both sides. Yes, and agreed on both right. sides. Totally agree. Totally right. agree. Vicky, did you want to say yeah, something? Just real quick, because uh, Catherine touched on a lot that I was uh, that I was thinking as well. But I don't think you can train for every single agreed. circumstance. It's just Absolutely impossible. Absolutely agreed. Mm -hmm. And so the the key here is that you know you in, put in and you, the park inspection program. There's not enough inspectors to inspect the park. That is true. And here we're talking about putting in another program, and you're asking how are you going to enforce that. Um, I think that's the that is the key crux mm -hmm. of the whole thing. It's going to be way too big, way too expensive, and frankly, we're trying to make the point that we that this may be a little bit overblown. We've got the 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 problems are more the exception than the rule. Thank you so Very much. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I make one last comment? Of course. You know. It's, it's really kind of interesting because I actually find out that some parks don't put out the California Civil Code, which is mm. against the law. <laughs> Why don't you? We all have to do an operating permit, permit mm -hmm. to operate, right? Why don't you put a little box on there that whether they've given out California Civil Code or not, then they can't use it as the excuse that they didn't put out the California Civil Code. Okay? That in itself gets the residents more up to speed on what's available to them, and that puts an owner at, at risk because... The violations of California Civil Code have penalties, okay? And I think everybody, I don't care who you are, and I'm sitting here putting some of my own people at risk, 
but they should be given out the California Civil Code. Absolutely. So their That's residents right. know, and maybe you can do it because we all have to pull annual permits. We have to check the boxes now for our fire, uh, fire checks and all the other stuff. So why not put a little box on there that you distribute it? Because once they check that box, they have a liability. Good suggestion. Before you, anybody have any closing comments? If, thank you all very much. Very good panel. Thank you very much for having You're us. You're very, very welcome. So next up is the director of HCD, Brett, Brian Metcalf. But I didn't see Brian. Oh, that guy did see you. I'm sorry, Brian. Yeah. But you're not Brian. No, I'm not. Senator Leavitt, uh, Richard Weiner. With the Richard, Housing. sorry, Richard. We have met. I apologize for not remembering your name. Ben just got here. Uh, if we can delay for a couple minutes, uh, he'll be in here to testify. Yes, absolutely. So how about if we take a little 10-minute break? Does right. that Thank seem you. good? Okay, so let's reconvene at about 10 minutes to 3. Thank you.
All right, if I can ask everyone to take their seats and we'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully everybody stretched their legs a little bit and is ready to be focused Could you press your, press and learn more good bar. stuff. You're hot. And when you speak, just make sure the mic's up close. Okay, thanks. All right, we are back on the record and we would like to Welcome our director of HCD, Housing and Community Development, Mr. Ben uh, Metcalf. I think the last time Ben and I uh, were working on a mobile home issue, you were about three or four days into your new job. So now you have a vast amount of experience, maybe what, six months? Yep. <laughs> well, welcome. We're very happy to have you here and happy to have you participate in our hearing on uh, just trying to decide if uh, park managers should be trained and if that's something that would help some of the uh, issues and complaints and violations that we have in mobile home parks in California. So welcome. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Leva, and thank you for your leadership on this important topic and all you've been doing in the area of mobile homes. Um, HCD uh, is pleased to participate in this hearing as the primary uh, state agency responsible for physical maintenance and operation of mobile home parks throughout the state. I know we've participated in many discussions along these lines in the past and we want to be a part of furthering uh, this good work and discussion. I'd like to get a little bit of background on HCD's role and how we might fit into the conversations that are going on today. That would be great. Uh, our job is, by law, primarily related to ensuring the health and safety of the parks and the manufactured homes located therein. We have an enforcement authority that is carried out through two primary programs, the Mobile Home Parks Program and the Occupational Licensing Program. Uh, both of those are operated under the authority of the Mobile Home Parks Act and Special Occupancy Parks Act. Under that authority, uh, we develop, administer, and enforce uniform statewide standards uh, for the benefit of park residents and users to provide decent living environment, uh, to protect their investments in manufactured homes, mobile homes, multi-unit manufactured homes, and recreational vehicles. The Parks Program has adopted and enforces preemptive state regulations for the construction, the use, maintenance, and occupancy of privately owned mobile home and special occupancy parks all throughout this great state. Now, local governments have responsibility for enforcement of Mobile Home Parks Act and Special Occupancy Park Act, along with adopted ordinances outside of parks, and may, at their discretion, assume enforcement responsibilities inside of parks. As of today, uh, local governments have jurisdiction over 908 parks representing some 97,000 mobile home lots in California. That's about 20% of all the parks statewide. When that scenario presents itself, when a local government has assumed enforcement obligations, uh, our responsibility is simply to ensure that the local government is properly doing its duty under the act. And occasionally, if we find a local jurisdiction is not performing, uh, we do have the right to take that authority back as was done recently in the city of San Clemente. Where we are the enforcement authority, uh, we conduct field operation activities. Uh, we have about 60 uh, phenomenally talented district representatives on our staff who are out crisscrossing the state every working day conducting field operations out of two area offices statewide. That includes plan checking, the design and specifications for new parks and additions, expans expansions or alterations, permitting and inspecting the installation of mobile homes and manufactured homes and accessory structures, and of course, investigating complaints of violations of the provisions of the Mobile Home Parks Act. Is that better? Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> In 2015, our district representatives conducted uh, 24,448 inspections. Now, when we discover a violation in a park, uh, on a lot, or a home that requires correction, the first thing we do is issue a notice of violation. That provides the responsible party 60 days, calendar days, to correct the issue. Now, in the case of an issue where we have an imminent health and safety hazard, uh, we won't give the 60 days. We'll require that those issues be corrected immediately. We document and report a number and type of all violations uh, to the Parks Act, to the Mobile Home Park Maintenance Inspection Task Force. And I can tell you that during the 2015 calendar year, the data shows 32% of all the violations we issued, we issued 15,900 violations, 
were for health and safety issues. To give you an example of what the top types of violations were that we issued against, they were unsupported gas meters, uh, lot lines not clearly identified, exposed live electrical parts or equipment uh, not suitable for a wet location or other electrical issues, uh, or uncapped drain inlets. Those are examples of the kinds of issues that we routinely flag. For the issues that are not health and safety, those tend to be resident vi violations. And let me give you some examples of those. Accumulation of rubbish or combustible material on lots, issues related to unsafe stairways or handrails on resident-owned property, and electrical violations within the lots, including, uh, as we sometimes see, the use of extension cords in lieu of permanent wiring or the locating of appliances outside the actual property. Uh, sheds uh, constructed uh, less than three foot from the lot, lot line is another issue of some concern from us. In addition, HCD's occupational licensing program is an important one for us. It includes five elements, uh, licensing, consumer complaint handling, continuing education, enforcement, and the Manufactured Home Recovery Fund. And let me talk about three of those in a little bit more detail as they're relevant to the hearing. First, licensing. Uh, the department administers examinations for manufactured home or commercial modular dealer or salesperson licenses. We do this at our headquarters office in Sacramento as well as at four field offices across the state. These examinations are multiple choice exams that cover the basic requirements of the law as well as our regulations that are specific to this particular license the applicant is seeking. We also handle consumer complaints against licensees. Uh, these are where uh, violations have been alleged. In calendar year 2015, we had 200 consumer complaints that were filed for investigation specific to HCD licensees or as it relates to unlicensed activity. When an investigation of a complaint or an audit reveals violations, we then proceed to issue an order to comply if the situation is one that can be corrected, or in certain circumstances, we will issue a civil, money, uh, civil monetary citation, uh, or we'll file an accusation against the licensee. To give you an example of sort of the scope of that, in calendar year 2015, HCD successfully issued $10,000 of citations for illegal or unlicensed sales activity. Uh, we also operate a mobile home ombudsman program that is for many folks uh, in mobile home parks sort of the first touch point when issues come up. They receive and process uh, all kinds of complaints for folks living in manufactured housing or mobile homes and we offer assistance through that mobile ombudsman on a variety of issues. Now some of the issues that come up uh, are things that we don't ourselves have jurisdiction over. Uh, but when we are able, we forward those issues to appropriate authorities that do have the jurisdiction and point the caller in the appropriate direction. In calendar year 2015, our ombudsman received a total of 2,181 complaints. 1,679 of those were mobile home park complaints. 257 were related to mobile home residency law. And 209 were related to illegal or unlicensed sales activity. Let me give you some of the examples of the top issues that come up through our ob ombudsman. Uh, poorly maintained park utility systems, uh, manufactured installation or, or work that's been done without the appropriate permits. Uh, we get complaints of illegal evictions or inappropriate rental increases, uh, substandard manufactured homes, accumulation of rubbish, fire issues, and utility billings are often a top issue that are received to us through our ombudsman. Now, well, not all of those are things that HCD itself has authority over or can immediately address. There are a number of items where when we get the complaint and it is within our purview, we're able to take action within our own authority. These include issues related to uh, obviously unsafe electrical, sewer, gas, or water systems, uh, unlawful or unfair sales practices manufactured home, uh, warranty, sales contract, and installation issues, uh, mobile home residency law copies and information on where to obtain assistance for lease management rent disputes, and then issues related to title, uh, fees, alteration, repairs, and other related sales information. 
Uh, we also are able to address issues on compensation for home sales and warranty fraud and misrepresentations. And of course, when a complaint comes in where there's uh, required to be resolution by the civil courts, HCD is able to direct uh, the caller to legal resources. We maintain lists of legal services organizations that can point them in the right direction. When those complaints come in uh, about illegal or unfair sales issues, uh, we do send out our occupational licensing investigators. We also have a number of preventative measures in the Mobile Home Parks Act that HCD enforces to make sure, sort of proactively, we're providing for appropriate parks. For example, uh, every park must have a responsible person available by telephone or similar means who can respond to an emergency in a timely manner. Uh, that person or designee must have knowledge of emergency procedures related to utility systems and common area facilities, but uh, as many of you are aware, uh, that requirement only applies when there are 50 more, uh, or reside in the park only when there are 50 or more spaces. Uh, what the data shows today is that uh, is currently true. In 2,229 of our parks, approximately 49% where we uh, have a requirement for uh, residential uh, occupancy. For the park operators and uh, the on-site staff, when they fail to maintain the park to the state's minimum standards, we do have certain abilities uh, to provide violation penalties that may range from civil financial penalties, misdemeanor convictions, or suspension of the park's permit to operate, uh, and sometimes to resulting ban on the collection of rent. Uh, we have found in our practice that the threat of a suspended permit can be a powerful incentive for a mobile home park owner to correct health and safety violations or to compel compliance for uncorrected residential violations. Uh, and we are pleased uh, today to report that only 36 of 4,500 mobile home parks are currently uh, contending with a suspended permit to operate. In summary, uh, we uh, do believe that homeowners and park operators need to be active partners uh, in maintaining parks in decent and safe condition. Uh, we are eager to live up to our full obligations and our authority at HCD to do the best to com com uh, comply with the law and play our part in making sure that these parks are a true asset for California communities and continue to provide a needed place for working families to live. We stand by ready to help in any way we can uh, to make sure that as we move forward with any possible uh, legislative changes that we can provide the technical assistance and support to make sure it works with HCD. So I thank you for your attention and consideration and, and to you, Chairwoman, for your leadership. Of course, we're here to answer your questions. Thank you very much. That was a really great, very comprehensive report. I had a question about the responsible person. So how do you enforce that and make sure that there is a responsible person? Come on, Richard. I'm gonna ask Richard to come up, our Deputy Director for Codes and Standards to answer that question. Richard Weinhardt. Richard, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we would only enforce that upon a complaint. Okay. Uh, how, complaint how do you go about... Oh, can you state your name for the record so that way... Richard Weinert. Thank you. Um, how would you... So you don't go looking actively. HCD doesn't go to a mobile home park and or a manufactured home park and check to see if they have a responsible person? No, we don't. Okay, so it's a requirement, but there's really no enforcement mechanism. That's correct. Okay, so to all of the points that you made, um, you know, earlier, Ben, um, about the 5,900 violation, 15,900 violations, and they were gas meters, lot lines, exposed electrical lines, uncapped sewage, uh, and a couple others. Those are the ones that I wrote down. Um, and then also what your ombudsman hears poorly maintained parks, work not done properly, rubbish buildup, uh, utility billings not accurate. Do you feel, does HCD feel that having a park manager education and licensing program would help with these issues and violations? Uh, we don't have a, a position, a formal position on that right now, but there is unambiguously a correlation between um, uh, uh, resident uh, folks who have the training and the expertise and folks who, who don't. And I think we, we do see that when we go into a park and we talk to folks where we see folks who are experienced and knowledgeable, we get better outcomes. Very good. Richard, any comment? 
no comment on that. Okay, very good. Uh, would HCD be willing to work together and try and find a creative, uh, a better way and create a better business-like atmosphere in mobile home parks that kind of seems to be desperately needed? How would you guys feel about helping us in something like that? I, I, I think many of our programs and the work that we're doing already aspire in that direction. And if there are other ways under existing authority or through uh, uh, new opportunities, we stand by to help. Okay, very good. Well, I look forward to working more with both of you. I've um, enjoyed getting to know both of you and HCD and what you uh, what you all are responsible for. There's a lot to be done. And I appreciate, I know when we had some earlier conversations about enforcement. You guys stepped up your game and just wanted to publicly thank you for that. I appreciate it. If you have any uh, closing comments you'd like to make, please do so at this time. I have no further comments. Okay. For the record. I'd like to say one thing, if please. I may. I, there's a lot of discussion on the mobile home ombudsman. I, I would like to yes. say that uh, there is one person that answers the phone. It, it is an unfunded program. Um, and there's two others that back that person up as far as record keeping. Uh, but they also split their time on our, our licensing investigation and those issues. So um, it, it is know. definitely a challenge with the size of the state. Yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank Gentlemen, you. thank you very much. Uh, we are going to go now to our public comment. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to thank all of the panelists. I think we've had some excellent uh, commentary today, and I've learned a lot. I hope all of you as well. So before we start the public comment, let's just thank everyone for their participation. And for our public comment, if you can use uh, this microphone over here to my left, your right, that would be terrific. And Tim had his hand raised. So one of our expert witnesses is also going to uh, do some public comment. Catherine. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, if you could, and everyone in the public comment, if you could state your name for the record before you begin speaking, that would be great. So again, uh, Catherine Borg on behalf of the Western Manufactured Housing Communities Association. I just want to um, correct the record on one of the issues that I had brought up in my testimony regarding the um, one of the residents who had um, a, allegedly had shot a turtle in the park. Um, apparently that is uh, a piece of sensational journalism and it's creating a lot of hardship for the family and I apologize. Not a problem. Thank, Thank you for clarifying that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Kimberly Clarkson. I'm from the infamous Lancaster Estates Mobile Home Park from which Ray Downing read the letter. I am the president of the newly formed GSMOL chapter. I did submit a testimony, and I would like to just read it here. It's only one page. No problem. Go right ahead. That mobile home park manager should be licensed with continuing education requirements every two to three years is a well and truly undisputed fact and a dire necessity. To interject, I'm a registered nurse, and I worked for Los Angeles County Office of Education for 18 and a half years. Not only was I required to have a nurse's license, but I had to obtain a health services credential for school nurses to work in the schools. That education was absolutely critical for the work that I did. The Department of Consumer Affairs should have the same complaint process that is now established for other professionals. This includes the requirement that all managers post their license in the park office so as to be clearly visible. This license should be adjacent to the name, address, and phone number of the park owners and the number of the, par the Department of Consumer Affairs in large, friendly letters right below. In addition, unscheduled inspections by the Department of Consumer Affairs should be ongoing on a yearly basis, with the inspectors required to meet with at least some of the homeowners, not just the managers. Complaints and evidence of financial mismanagement should result in an independent audit at the owner's expense. Any park employee who has committed criminal activity and are caught must be required to be prosecuted. The owners of the park cannot just fire them due to some vague philosophical justification, justification such as the claim of a, quote, spiritual connection or a, quote, fear of bad karma. 
These are both expressions this witness has heard concerning a park owner. Furthermore, curriculum must include, but not necessarily be limited to the following college level, semester course length courses. Business administration and management, two classes. Basic accounting, one course minimum. These managers handle thousands upon thousands of dollars. Real estate transaction in mobile home parks, one class. MRL Title 25 Chapter 11 Knowledge, one to two courses. Ethics, one class, perhaps the most important class, with a reading list which might possibly include Dell Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, and perhaps C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. Tongue in cheek there, just a bit. <laughs> After two years of managerial experience, an additional certif certificate should be completed concerning MRL-related city ordinances in the manager's locale. For example, because mobile home park residents are unfamiliar and city employees are often, but not always, clueless, managers must know and be able to clearly explain items and issues such as pass-through assessments and or rent control issues if relevant. I believe that any new legislation should be drafted to ensure that existing park managers are not grandfathered in. Every manager now working must be given five years to complete the coursework, but must submit coursework showing progress every year. Education, professional training, and owner park security scrutiny are foundational, however, one practice must also be regulated, and it is not limited to the Antelope Valley. No homeowner slash resident should be permitted to volunteer to work for the park in which he or she lives. In the experience of many, including myself, managers ask certain helpful homeowners to explain the laws to other homeowners. They send these volunteers out in the golf carts or walking to assess properties in need of cleanup or repair so as to comply with Title 25 and MRL codes and or the park rules. Then the managers have those volunteers report back to them, resulting in resentment. These homeowners become an extension of management doing the jobs managers should be doing, deflecting residents' emotions away from the managers where it belongs and onto the volunteer residents pitting homeowner against homeowner. While these special homeowners claim to their last breath to be strictly volunteers, they never are. Manners, managers inevitably acknowledge their efforts by decreasing their rent, inviting them to invitation-only after-hour pool parties, providing dinners, and many other perks. Managers show their appreciation, and homeowners are set against one another. Enacting legislation takes time, we understand. Conviction and recognition that listening to mobile home park owner concerns simply is not enough. Legislatures responsible for drafting protective mobile home park laws should visit parks in California and provide a resource for homeowners to contact for assistance and counsel until the regulatory process and licensure for all managers is complete. A final note, local and state code enforcement officials address Title 25 that spill into the MRL, maybe. Please pass legislation which dictates to officials that they may not say the following three things when mobile home park owners come to them for help. Number one, quote, well, there are other parks in the area much worse than yours. <laughs> Two, well, that's a civil issue, so get a lawyer. Three, well, if you don't like it, move. Unless and until mobile home parks are effectively regulated and those that live in them are effectively protected, the following words should be placed over the entrance of almost every mobile home park in California. From Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, The Inferno, the sign above the vestibule to the first circle of hell reads, quote, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here.
Thank you. Kimberly, thank you for your very comprehensive testimony. And you said you'd submitted that already, correct? Yes, I did. Thank there you very people, much. Quite all right. Th thank you very much. Very good. My Next. name is Eloise Reyes, and I had the privilege of being invited to Mobile Home Park uh, here locally by some of my volunteers. I was appalled. Uh, they, they shared with me all of the problems that were going on in the park. We had a number of residents. They said to me that they have been complaining and complaining. They got a visit from only one state legislator. That was their Senator Connie Leva. And they felt that the only reason that people would come to them is only to come get votes, but that it was important for them that they don't want just words, they want action. And the only one who did provide that was Senator Connie Leva. And I want to thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise. Thank you. Next. Hi, can you hear me? We can okay, hear you, go yeah. right ahead. My name is Clementine Estrada, 75 years old. I live in El Cajon, California, and I've been a mobile home resident now for three years. I retired several times. I used all my life savings to buy a home. And like, that was a great speech. Those who enter here, watch out. They were so interested in getting me to buy a home. I was just looking at that. I was looking at my future. I was looking at where I was going to go. And now when I can no longer really actively work, I find that I'm going to be homeless in seven years. I was lucky enough to get a lease from a, home, a manager that was fired for giving me the lease. But I today pay $200 less than my neighbor. OK? And in seven years, when my lease is up, I'll have to go to market rate, and my rent will go up three or four hundred dollars in one month. Clementine, I, are, are you are you speaking about the park manager and yes. the, and, and well, licensing policies? Okay. Okay. And the thing is, is that the education I have tried to go to every agency that there is, and I have found that the ombudsman. The HCD is understaffed. They can't come out and inspect. They won't come out and inspect things. So I'm looking at what you're doing right now, which is an effort to try to get things educated, try to get people to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. But the question is no longer, is there a need for it? It's been 30 years. The debut started in the 60s. They did the MRL. Then people figured out, Nobody's enforcing the MRL, so I guess we can do whatever we want. And when I go as a brand new person moving into mobile home parks to try to get somebody to help, there isn't anybody. And I certainly don't have the funds to go do civil court. I don't have my government. My government is telling me that they want to protect my rights, but my government is not doing that. And I say right now, and my only message really, is the timing has to happen. And you have agencies in place. And what I do not see happening is action. You have a community college system in place that can do the education. Do the course shell. The minute you do a course shell, for one person you can, you can educate 100,000. The internet is here. We have to respond to where society has come to today. In my, in my park, 30% of our people are renters now. Mm. So we have landlord law, tenant law, MRL, and, and the poor park manager coming in has no clue what applies. And some of the lawyers that they have are not very good either, so I'll say that. They Cl issued notices that are not right, so they don't know how to do it, okay? The other thing that I saw out of this thing is that HCD already has an enforcement policy in place. You can do enforcement by complaint. You don't have to have an agency, and it doesn't have to cost money to run around and see if park managers are licensed. If, you're, if you get a complaint from that park and that park manager is not licensed, there's a fine. Then you can have more, more inspectors. <laughs> and I think that that's probably the solution. The Something economic we have solution thought about. is the only one that will work, and enforcement has to be the clue. I don't need to have people know more about MRL. We already know that. 
But what we also know is that it doesn't matter. They go around it. So we need to have that action in place. And Clementine, thank you very much. Your comments are appreciated and noted. And, and I would um, ask you to feel free to call my office if you have questions, and we would be more than happy to help. And we didn't help you? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Call any time. Next. Thank you. Thank you for all the comments. And uh, I'm Ken Meng. I'm the first generation uh, to the United States. And I live Welcome. in a mobile home for six years. And I have seen a lot of negative stuff, a lot of emotions. And it caused me to come to serve. I think this is uh, a pretty big problem in the nation in the mobile home park. And uh, right now, I'm the president. I'm president of a uh, coalition of mobile home owners, California. And uh, today, I come down here, bring some uh, suggestions. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Senator Leva and uh, Stephanie, and uh, all the members in the committee, and to hold this hearing. And thank you for all the audience come down here and to support the hearing. And thank you for all you guys uh, in Sussastic to serve the communities of uh, mobile home parks. And uh, I brought here a stack, but don't worry about it. I'm just going to introduce the first page. And this is uh, suggestions from Common Call. And we have uh, the magazine and put on the table there if you're interested to take it. And uh, we will attend the next week, the national meeting in uh, Las Vegas. I hope you guys see you, see you guys there. And the first of the suggestion is we feel the Senate select committee need to examine their properties. Additional legislation will do nothing without viable form of enforcement. Homeowners need an uh, alternate to uh, hiring an uh, attorney and uh, go e going to court to SSC, MHC, held a hearing on this very subject 30 years ago. At that time, advocates testified, A, few attorneys really understand, understand the mobile home law. B, few homeowners can afford the thousands of dollars necessary to litigate. C, homeowners don't have the time for protracted litigation. D, homeowners are often seniors. And E, the courts often are not well versed on the mobile home law. Under the present form of enforcement, the cards are stacked against the homeowners. Second, we suggest the number one property of the committee and the state legislature should be enforcement of the civil code rather than manager training. Common call would welcome, welcome a hearing on enforcement in the near future. Three, one example of an enforcement alternative is the Manufacturer Housing Dispute Resolution Program of Washington State. This program does provide some enforcement for civil code violations at a minimal cost to residents, $5 a year. And it works. Both park owners and residents can submit complaints to the program, which in the turn investigates and levies fines as necessary. We question why there hasn't been a stronger push to pass similar legis legislation in California. Could it be that attorneys don't want it? 
We think that's really a possible. And the four, manager training and the certification can follow with enforcement. Manager training and the certification makes sense. Five, advocates for residents, GSML, Common Call, and others can play a significant role in enforcement. A, they can alert managers and owners when they feel a law is being broken. B, they can present the law as written and uh, their interpretation via an attorney. C, they can continue to educate mobile or manufactured homeowners as to their rights. They can suggest modifications to existing laws that would help protect residents. E, they can expose and scrupulous park owners and managers, hopefully to state body, which will investigate and levy fines if park owners are violating the law. Six, the Time Points Bill of Rights already explains many rights and the responsibilities of residents and the park, park managers. It should be included in any training program. Ken, I, I, Ken, sir, I don't mean to interrupt you, but are you gonna go through the whole packet? It would probably good if you okay, submitted no, 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 it to yeah. us. Okay, so very nine good. Nine points. Thank so you. Two, two more, thank, thank you. you. Uh, seven, WMA should promote and enforce their own code of ethics. Eight, we suggest developing the, a code of ethics for park managers in order to promote commonly accepted per, uh, practices of good customer service. Nine, we suggest the committee of advocates and the state representative be formed to study this issue in depth rather than simply having a hearing with often accomplish nothing and get swept under the rug soon after it is held. We suggest that they submit their findings to the SNC, MHC, GSML, or Common Call can take the pulse of the homeowner community and uh, otherwise done. Okay, uh, this is uh, briefly uh, this book, about this book and it will hand it to Senator Leva. And I must give the credit to uh, the, our former uh, president, Mr. Frank Wally. He devoted himself. Great, thank you very much. And make sure we get a copy so that we can read it. Sure. Thank, thank you very you, much. Sir. Good afternoon, Senator. Thank you for giving us this forum to be able to come and speak with you. I appreciate that. Our pleasure. Um, I'm not going to get into my personal situation. Can we get your name for the record? My, my name is Carrie McEwen. Thank you, Carrie. I am Please at proceed. Rancho Velocitas Mobile Home Park. The owners of the park are Millennium Housing. I moved into the park in 2012 of December and lived there with my husband and my son. So without going into any more detail about that, I will just say this. Millennium has been very active in kicking, trying to kick our family out of our home, hmm. but there has been two judges in two superior courtrooms who have sustained my motion and have found in my favor, my family's favor, and has told Millennium that they're not going to support their eviction notice against my family. However, Millennium is very aggressive and they are now appealing that. Having said that, what I'm really coming here today about is a section code, which is found in the ML. Um, it is section code 79856B. Anybody who owns a mobile home should fear that section code because all it states 
Senator, is that that section code gives power to park owners to kick us out of our home based on anything they decide is a substantial annoyance. I have a neighbor lady who was caught keying my car. She went to jail. She also um, was hosing down a woman who is dying of pancreatic cancer. She went to jail for hosing her down. She's attacked park employees and Haven Management has sent her letters telling her to leave those employees alone. Having said that, she has never received that section code 79856B as a substantial annoyance. And do you think this has to do with the park manager not being trained? Because that's what we're discussing. You what that is, but I would have to assume that must be the reason. Because if, if you, because this specific issue, we'd be happy to deal with it offline. We're really just trying to do testimony on whether or not park managers should be trained. I think the problem is this: that section code is so broad. Mm -hmm. All it states is substantial annoyance. So park managers, you have taken it so where they don't have any accountability. They can decide on their own if they don't like you that they can call you a substantial annoyance and kick you out of your home. That is the power that that code has given to park managers and to their friends. And everybody knows park managers, I don't know who the woman was that spoke earlier, the very first lady, mm -hmm. she got it right. Park managers have their friends go out and they are the ones saying, oh, guess what's happening over here? Well, I will say this, Senator, that lady I spoke about who keyed my car and all of that, she, her best friend is the manager. So I can't well, tell I, I, you what her thought process is, but the evidence is very clear. I appreciate all that. And when we're weighing whether or not we should um, have legislation and park management training, we will absolutely look at that code and weigh that. that we clear up that section code. I got you. It's just it not leads... what we're here for today. That's all. Okay. Um, but I am... I am being kicked out of my home for that section code. And, and, and you, if I am, I will not be the, the first or the last resident that will be kicked out of our homes based on that section code. I have spent $30,000 protecting myself and my family to be able to stay in my home because of that section code. And my fear, I have a 76 year old mother who lives also in one of the parks. Her fear is that she could be kicked out of her home because of that section. We code. got it so noted as we're moving through trying to fix things. We will look at that as that well. That would be Thank all you. that I had to say today. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very much, Carrie. Yes, sir. Yeah, hello. My name is David Martin. I'm out of Escondido down in North San Diego County. I'd like to thank you for having this meeting and inviting us. And it was kind of short notice, but um, I'd also like to think that they give this mobile home residency law the full book each year to each resident at least once. That way they could start off the year with a full book, not unabridged sections that some managers or some landlords have typewritten themselves. And I was also like to say that I do believe that the manager should be somewhat trained or licensed, but also there should be a background check on the managers hmm. required that they should be checked with the FBI and they should be fingerprinted for any outstanding warrants in other states because several managers have warrants in other states. And I do think that that should be checked with the fingerprints and everything. That could be so, part of it, sure. Yeah, so I do think that should be written in there also. So thank you very much for having us. Like I said, I do think this book is very handy and it's been very handy over the years. And we've had to go to senators over the years for other residents and other parks about tree issues. And we had to help get the tree and driveway bill passed by Senator Joe Dunn years ago. So thank you for your help too. Thank you, David. Thank you for coming out today. Well, I think that concludes our hearing. I, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. Please go right ahead. Yes, hello, my name is Sam Mung. Hi, Sam. Am, hi, Senator Leva and everyone in the audience. Thank you for attending this meeting. Um, I am the now a board member of Comocal. Mr. Ken Ming, who testified earlier, is my father. I am also mm. a board member of our local park, of our parks um, residents association, and we have experienced a lot, including facing evictions, facing managers who restrict our clubhouse usage, 
facing managers who use unscrupulous towing companies to tow our cars away, facing managers who scared our seniors so much, where when you see our seniors, they're when they see the park manager, they're cowering with fear. When you see that, you know there's something wrong with that mobile home park. And after actions through our, through our family, we am facing eviction because of the mobile home residency law. We were able to get over 185 spaces to sign, to have us to represent them, to speak with a park owner. And because of that, we, the, park own, the park manager was kicked out of the park, but he was, they were just really transferred to a different mobile home park. And the rent was not raised for one year. That was another big complaint that we still have today. And the roads are fixed. And the, club, the clubhouse restrictions are less. And we are grateful for the MRL give us the ability to assemble, to have to make sure that right is there, because that is a right that we need, every, every park needs, in order to ensure their residents are protected. But this is, as spoken by GSMOL, this is the first law that the managers want to break when residents want to com unite together because they know this is the law that allows residents to stand up to actions that are not right. So when I s looked at this hearing, I often visit the Senate Committee website. I'm thankful for information on there. And when I saw this hearing on the website, the word that popped to my mind the most was license, the licensure of management. And the reason why this popped up to me the most is because with license comes enforcement. And that's what I hope this, this may lead to, because what we really need is enforcement of the mobile home residency law. Residents don't have the money to hire an attorney to defend themselves in a lawful detainer action or to sue the park owner for actions that may be against the law, but if they do lose, they have to pay attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. And just speaking about the, our mobile home park case of, of evicting our family, even though the judge ruled that we would not be evicted, that they cannot evict us, the judge, after an appeal, had to rule that we have to pay their attorney's fees. And their attorney's fees were $25,000. Mm. The judge, after realizing what happened, all of this, under his discretion, he lowered it to $3,000. But it's still a substantial amount of money for a family to pay. We had to get money drawn out from a banking account for something that they did wrong. And this is not right. And this has to be changed. One of the suggestions was dispute resolution, even brought up by the, by, by the Park Owner Association, where informal resolutions can solve a lot of problems. And we agree that there can be that, like Washington State has a dispute resolution program, California should also strongly consider this program also. Lastly, I want to say is, With license, we must have some enforcement in there. Enforcement of, just like license of an attorney can be removed if they, and they cannot practice law anymore if they disobey their code of ethics, there should be sim similar type of license to management. If a management is good and there are no complaints, then there's no problems. But if there are problems, that's when this can be enforced. And I think this may be the most viable way for at least this issue. But the committee must still remember that not all the issues will be resolved with management and alternative dispute resolutions may be very helpful. So I wanna thank the committee for bringing this hearing after 
not having hearing for more than five years. And I'm so thankful that we're finally starting on our feet again to fix these issues because these have been going on for a long time. And we already suffered a long time. So I support requiring training as I know there are management that just needs to know something, but that's not enough because we also do know that there are management that are in there for kickbacks or that are in there that may be getting money that part owners don't know about, that may be doing something illegal. And we need to have enforcement and on the license of the park management. Very good. Sam, thank you very much for your testimony. <laughs> yes, sir, please state your name. I'm Lloyd Rochambeau. Welcome, Lloyd. I'm the president of the San Marcos Mobile Home Residents Association, representing all the parks in San Marcos. Um, I sent you a, a one-page uh, statement uh, about my viewpoint on licensing and training of managers. I think it's absolutely essential and it would be one small step towards enforcement and getting some things done, some things straightened out that have been lacking for 40 years. Mm. I've been licensed uh, going back in, well, 40 years ago, I was licensed as a nursing home administrator when they first began the program. In fact, I wrote a uh, study guide for the California portion of the test. Uh, I've been licensed as a real estate agent. I've been licensed as a uh, continuing care retirement community or residential care facility administrator. Uh, I currently hold a occupational license from HCD for selling of, of mobile and manufactured homes. And I think licensing is absolutely essential. And I support it a thousand percent. Now, we've heard a lot of little excuses about some places being too small. Well, it doesn't have to include, let's say, anything under 50 spaces or and they could be uh, handled on the internet or something. It doesn't have to be that they sit for a, a, a day at least in training, and it doesn't have to be that they have to pay a large, large uh, licensing fee. But I think the whole program is essential, and I think it should be done. So I'm urging you. I'm kind of disappointed that there's no other senators here on this select committee. I've never seen any of them. I'll report They're back the to them. Time. It's kind yeah. of a passion of mine, okay. this, this thank committee. You your, Lloyd, thank I you very much for your time. comments. I appreciate it. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Prochnow. Thank you so much for your time and for allowing this forum. And I appreciate all the comments and the education um, by all the people who are who have been presenters here. Uh, just briefly, my parents are about two months new to the mobile home community, and already they are having uh, some nightmares. Uh, and I think it, it is very, very essential that managers do get some training because um, it appears that they do take some uh, rights that are not within their purview to make decisions that are really, you know, against uh, certain people um, because they're Mexican or because they spoke too loud or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what, uh, it is important that they are interviewed. Unfortunately, the place where they live is owned, I believe, by the state. And so um, I think the rules are a little bit different. Uh, but uh, for example, there was this woman who everybody complains about. They are trying to get rid of her for I don't know how long. And uh, one day my sister was crossing the driveway and she almost ran over her because she was driving so fast. So I went to management and the lady said, well, we told her several times, but she still does it. That's her. You know, things like that to where a manager should not take a nonchalant attitude about complaints. 
Um, also, uh, it seems to me that uh, the question regarding the cost for keeping track could be minimum. Uh, it would take a program that would pop up every year and it would uh, show who hasn't been licensed and you know only those people should be followed up on. Um, I used to write programs and it, it should not be very difficult to do if and then, very simple. So that's my suggestion. Again, I appreciate your time very much. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Hello, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Darlene Morales. Hello, and Darlene. I'm actually Sylvia's sister, and I live there with my parents. I'm their caregiver, and I did have to, you know, go to her doctor and get documents and signatures and all of those things. And I know someone had mentioned something about like caregivers. Well, with me, I had to go, you know, I had to go through the whole thing. It wasn't like I just showed up, oh, I'm taking care of my parents. Like I actually had to have notes written from all of her doctors and things like that. But I do know that some of the people that live in the park are the caregivers. And I don't know how that even happens or why it happens. But the thing with our manager, um, she is, I'm not exactly how old she is, but she's, you know, she actually has to drive her car to the office because she cannot walk there. And um, unfortunately, she is a very um, passive person, more than she, she gets very nervous and afraid where there's any kind of conflict. And there's a panel there and they kind of voted, they appointed each other. And any kind of, uh, you know, matter that has, that arises, um, for example, this is a great example. I actually um, remembered this. I brought it with me, and it's an agenda of one of the recent meetings that we had. And what happens is that the management never uh, makes it okay for any of the residents to say, hey, you know, I have a question. Hey, you know, should we get voted on it? And so um, I have here just a recent uh, meeting that there was, and the park wants to spend almost $29,000 $29,000 that they appointed each other, um, that they want to use over things like uh, seven seven thousand dollars to to put up like a little nice sign when you drive, you know, you go into the driveway. How could that be okay? How could that be okay? So you're thinking so, if managers were trained that that would make it better? Well, I'm not worse? too sure that she, the, the actual park manager, really. I think they step all over her actually, and they just kind of run amok and do whatever they want am amongst each other. And many times, personally, that has happened to me that I've seen, she's actually as the groundskeeper to go driving around and well, I don't know anything, well, why don't you talk to him? And then he just starts screaming and yelling. And when we do have opinions, you know, he, he's very, his voice is very loud. He doesn't want to hear anybody. And there's a, a gentleman by the name of John Davis. And he, yeah, when you hear that name, a lot of people really laugh about it. Because sometimes I have here in the report, sometimes he's a, he's a financial reporter. Uh, just the other day, he was a property manager. So he just seems to have different titles. And I do know from other residents that they have had concerns. They have called his office and nothing has gotten resolved. And, and Darlene, we would be happy to help you with that. We're kind of trying to keep focused okay, on licensing yeah, or non-licensing. Yeah, when, well, that's what I'm saying, that I think for her and her age and I think in her circumstance, I'm not sure how education or getting her licensed or anything like that, I don't know how that would work okay. for someone in her condition. And um, there's just a lot of little things that she lets get by. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I can give you a really quick example, and then I'm, I'm, I'm done. Um, one of the groundskeeper guy that he goes around giving violation warnings if you're parked on the, on the guest parking, um, he just goes around giving violations because, you're, you know, the steps were a little dirty or something. And a lot of these homeowners, they're by themselves. They're older, and they're by themselves. So um, he um, just, you know, just just I walked into the office one day and she was there and he was there. Well, when I walked in just at that particular moment, he was talking to her about myself and our home. And he was literally high fiving her for saying about my car and my father's car. Oh, yeah. I got them. Yeah, I got her on her Camry. Oh, yeah, I got him on his Nissan. And they were high-fiving each other over it. And so I was just so, ugh. but like I said, the park manager, she's older. It, it would have been, 
you know, just not appropriate for me to say, hey, you can't be doing that. But but that's what's going on is that she's having the groundskeeper almost do her job because she's older and she can't do her job herself. So I don't know, like I said, if, if any kind of education, training or license for her would work. And then maybe like how some of these people are saying, someone brought up about the thousands of dollars that she's counting, that she's taking in every time that the mortgages are being paid. So just a lot of little things like that that, you know, everybody kind of touched on. And I have like a whole list of things that if you read them, you'd go, OK, no, this has to stop. <laughs> but anyway, well, thank you guys for listening. And um, thank you, darling. You know, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. I would like to once again thank all of our panelists and everyone who participated and very much thank the residents who came today and took your time to be here. Um, many of you have been to some of the town halls that we have hosted. We will continue to host those. But I feel that we've spent the last uh, year and a half kind of uh, taking in the issues and understanding, trying to understand what they are. And I really look forward to working with everyone um, and improving the situation in, uh, in mobile home and manufactured home parks. And just want to thank everyone again for your time and effort. And we won't get everything resolved tomorrow, but I will commit to all of you that I will keep moving forward and keep um, keep working on resolving these issues. So thank you all very much.